Cascade, one of our priorities needs to be asking, what is it that makes the Cedar Valley the type of place people want to live, want to work? Um, and kind of going with some of the 2030 planning you guys did, you know, it's always easier as a business to retain your existing customers and to bring on new ones. What is it the people who are here are looking for? Um, so I'll kind of go into some of our programming and how it's going to address some of that. But even though I say all that, when you dig into the numbers, interestingly, even though we lost about 2,600 jobs in the last five years, a lot of that for the out-migration, we actually gained net income because a lot of the jobs that we lost were the lower uh, training requirement, lower uh, pay jobs. We actually grew significantly in some of what are called the cool jobs, which are kind of the science, technology, engineering, mathematics. So even though we lost net jobs, we actually gained total income in the region. So it's not all bad news. We're actually doing pretty well as a community. But I think anytime you see that we're losing people that are deciding to move away, it raises that question for us in the long term of what is it that really is going to make people want to stay here. Um, so quick to kind of jump into it, there's a few main areas. Talent attraction, you've kind of seen it anchored in the past by Live the Valley and some of the talent attraction initiatives there. Um, but some of the things we really want to focus on, some of this kind of came from your 2030 planning as well as a lot more newcomer events. You know, businesses here do a very good job, and we've heard this from a lot of HR people, of onboarding their employees when they get the job. But just like an employer, we have to onboard them to the community. I can't tell you how many times I hear from people that they've lived here for two or three years, but they don't actually go to any clubs. They, don't, they haven't joined anything. So we're going to start this next year doing uh, at least two uh, newcomer events where it's a social. We buy the first drink, do it in single speed downtown here. We invite the clubs, the running clubs, the biking communities, everyone to have someone there. So it's a chance for anyone that's moved here new to connect with the organizations they're interested in. But then also for us, it's a chance to help the employers sell the community. Um, we hear that all the time. They can sell their company, but it's not their job to sell the community. That's our job. Um, more summer intern events. We used to do these uh, a couple of years back. But for a lot of students working here over the summer, we want to get them into the downtowns. We want to get them out to Lost Island. We want them to see all the stuff. Because again, usually one of the things I've heard from a lot of those students is, uh, we used to do some tours in downtown Waterloo to see the apartments, to see the new recreational stuff, the music going on. And for most of them, they've never come to downtown Waterloo. And having gone to you and I, I can tell you it's pretty common. Uh, so we want to do a lot more through the summer to get people out around town. Um, renewing the relocation magazine. Uh, we've been putting together a lot more relocation support materials for employers that they can use to attract people here. Um, placemaking is going to be a really big focus. And placemaking, there's a lot of terms, definitions for it. Really, though, the focus is on what are we investing in. Um, and it's not what do we do in one year, the market, this community. It's what do we do over the next 10 years to make sure the things we've invested in as a community are the things people need and want to see uh, to remain here. Um, a lot more extended focus on young professionals. We don't really have any highly active young professional groups anymore. And when you look at the numbers, we are actually gaining population in the 35 to 44-year-old age range, but we lose a lot before that age range and a lot right after that. So you do see, you know, we always say we're a great place to raise a family. We do see people moving back to raise a family, but a lot of them aren't choosing to stay here after they raise their family. And then when you see the uh, acceleration of retirements in the last year or so, our, our labor force is shrinking. Um, and that's just nationally, as the baby boomer generation starts to retire out of the workforce. So we're seeing a lot. We need to be much more intentional about how we engage young professionals in the community. And not just on professionalism, the jobs, careers, but also people are looking for ways to get involved in the community and not just serving on boards. They want to be hands-on, join clubs, be involved in organizations. So finding a way to do a lot more of that. Uh, so one of the other things we do for Grocer Valley is being that point of contact for the businesses. Um, we've kind of got the comprehensive listing of all the resource providers, organizations to connect to for employing uh, ex-offenders, all the resources to plug into for attracting new talent. A lot of employers and new HR professionals just don't have time to figure it all out. Um, so even the last couple months, been meeting with some of the larger employers. Uh, Birch has new HR in place. We just met with um, Master Brand Cabinets. They've got 100 open positions right now. And they'll hire everyone they can. She knows they have some um, need to look at their pay rate for the area. But so we were working with her. She's brand new there, just moved to the area, so getting her connected to all the organizations. So that's one of the big things we want to focus on being a lot more intentional about is being that point of contact so employers know they don't need to go and try and search for every organization out there that they can connect with. We can do that for them. Um, on the doing the better job of looking at our local workforce who's here, we are lower than the state average in our participation rate. 
So of all the people of working age able to work, fewer of them, about 3%, at least pre-COVID, the numbers kind of get skewed after that. Um, we're about 3% lower, which represents about 3,500 people here locally who could be in the workforce, but for some reason aren't. So we're gonna do a lot more working with our economic inclusion partnership, um, which is a kind of a collection of a lot of the employers in the area. We host the annual economic inclusion summit to look at what are those barriers. Um, right now we know childcare is a huge one, so we have been working with Mary Jansen and their work on that. Transportation is one that we're still hearing a lot about. about. Um, but some of the companies like Master Brand, she's willing to invest in addressing transportation, but she needs help connecting with Met Transit, figuring out what are the barriers, why aren't those things in place, so doing a lot more to be that convener between those partners to figure out how do we actually do something about, say, getting more small, not buses, but van transport set up for third shift positions out in the toward Master Brands area. Um, and then lastly, on that piece, um, we're doing a lot more too. One of the point of contact pieces is being the kind of intermediary between the school systems. Uh, so this is something I used to do that I'm now kind of rebuilding all the relationships of uh, the relationships and serving on the board for a lot Waterloo Career Center, Cedar Falls CAPS program, a lot of the training programs and initiatives. They struggle to get connections with employers. It's just hard to get employers to have the time to talk to everybody. So doing that job of being there as a representative on behalf of the business community so that we can, one, help pour more, pull more resources from the business community to those organizations but then also help align some of their programming. Um, a couple of areas they're seeing is a lot of youth are not interested in technology careers across the board, so, um, software development, manufacturing, advanced manufacturing. And it's just because that stuff is technically more difficult and you don't see it in your day to day. So we see a big gap in kind of the eighth to 10th grade where youth get exposed, but then lose interest. The highest areas of interest are usually culinary and cosmetics because that's what we know. That's what we see day to day. Um, so doing a lot more, we're looking at uh, the Delta V pro coding program, the Nubo code down in Cedar Rapids. It's a software development, kind of non-accredited, but accelerated training program. There's a good chance with some of the ARPA funds potentially to help fund a program like that. Uh, so we're working with them to see what that model would look like. Uh, and then helping support the Ignite program that Hawkeye's doing uh, over at the TechWorks campus and expanding that out. So then just really quick, wanted to give an update on what we're bringing over then for a lot of the innovation and entrepreneurship side of things. Um, so BBA, the Black Business and Entrepreneur Accelerator, so we were able to partner with them. I know last year when we updated, we we're kind of in the pilot stage. We were able to get them $600,000 in funding from the Kauffman Foundation and from the state of Iowa. So that was enough for about two to three year pilot period for that. They're on the third cohort now, I think, and had, once this cohort graduates, close to 35 graduate companies. Um, they've, I've been hands off with that for the last couple months. They've been running with that. Um, Roshanda on the team has been doing an amazing job. They had 36, I think, applicants in the last cohort of it for 12 spots. So they're going great. Um, we're going to be relaunching a lot of the programming we had been going right before COVID and had to put a pause on, but co-starters, kind of like a 16, well, nine week. Um, I wouldn't necessarily call it a business acceleration program, but it's more training founders to understand each piece of their business model financial model, revenue generation, their expenses. So it's more of how are we training people to know how to build sustainable, successful businesses. So we're gonna be relaunching that in partnership with UNI. Um, and then we've been working with them too on the BBA program. So some of the program is modeled after each other. Um, as well, Launch Cedar Valley, uh, we kicked off again later last year, um, kind of meant to be the beacon for a lot of the innovation startup stuff happening. So we're partnering with Clay & Milk out of Des Moines. Uh, they're a, kind of a statewide digital publication on technology. We're going to be working with them on one article a month on our local technology companies, things that are happening here. They'll be publishing it through Clay & Milk statewide, but then we'll also have that content to use here to syndicate with the courier and just get more of those stories out in the community. Um, then we've been strengthening a lot more of those connections with a lot of the venture capital network. Um, we have the local seed fund now that is sustainable. They are kind of off and running on their own. Um, so they're no longer officially supported by the nonprofit. Uh, they're just kind of running on their own. They've got their own funding. All of, 10 of the 11 have continued on past the first three years. Um, so we've been doing a lot more to connect with the state funding for their demo grants and doing a lot better job of helping connect our local startups with that whole process because it's once you're in the process, there's steps. We just didn't have those local inroads. So doing a lot more of the work with that and then all the back-end connections of how do we partner with BBEA to make sure companies going through that are connected into these networks. Um, 
So again, I know there's way more than there than I can dig into now, but if you guys have any questions, we can follow up after. Good job, you guys. Danny. Good job. I'm just going to give a brief uh, TechWorks update, and for those of you who have been able to tour the LSB facility in the top three floors of the Tech One building, it's stunning. And if you haven't been able to take a look there, I know they welcome you to come through at any time and or get a hold of any one of us, and we make sure that we can make that connection for you too. But LSB is still growing, and so they are in the process of looking to renovate their third floor that they purchased, which is the fourth floor of the building. So in addition to the top two that have been done for a few months, they're now looking at the fourth floor uh, to, re to renovate as well. Um, UNI has expand expanded even more on the first floor, so they now lease the entire first floor of the Tech One building. And with these exciting projects, the Tech One building is approaching be becoming almost um, fully occupied and a milestone we've been working towards um, for 14 years. And I know all of you have been watching me up here for 14 years talking about we're, we're getting close, we're getting closer, but we really are getting close and we're almost fully occupied. Um, given the lease status then, the TechWorks Board of Directors will be shifting representation on the board to include more industry and innovation leaders. So um, this is a welcome transition because now we're getting out of the real estate business and the leasing business and much closer to the mission mode of unleashing innovation in the many industries represented throughout the building. So it's great news and we're really excited to continue sharing that with all of you. Um, so you've heard high level updates from many of our team members. I want to thank Jim Schaefer for being here too from the community development side of what we do. Um, economic development is the contract we have with the city so that's why we share mostly updates from the economic development um, efforts that come through our team. Um, but I'd like to now ask Becky Gwen, that, as I mentioned earlier, she's the chair of our um, board of directors, she's Waterloo factory manager from Deer, and Becky is probably one of the busiest people you'll ever know. So the fact that she's here with us tonight is a, <laughs> is a real treat. Yeah. Yep. So here you go, Becky. Carrie, let me thank you, though, for getting out word of our training and some of that. You've been a great partner in doing that. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome, Becky. Nice yeah, to thank have you, you here. It's an honor to be here today. And I'd like to take a minute just to thank the Grow Cedar Valley team. I think it's awesome to see all the different things that they're working on. So, you know, having been back in the community for over two years now and, and with Deer, it's been awesome to see what they're trying to focus on, whether we've been trying to hire over 700 employees this last year and then even the focus on placemaking. So, you know, I got the opportunity to sit with the team and go through the strategic planning. And the, and the ongoing focus on workforce development, I think, is a differentiator as we think about how do we attract and retain people here in the Cedar Valley, making this one of the best places to live and work. Super supportive of all of that. And then even the work on the placemaking side. So I want to take this opportunity really to thank you guys as much as anything on um, being a partner with that. I also get the opportunity to sit on the Waterloo Development Corp. So you see some of the work that they're trying to do in the downtown area with the property acquisitions and continue to do redevelopment there. And I just can't say enough about the ongoing support we do get from the Waterloo community, whether it is, you know, in working on how do we engage the workforce in a different way, whether it's trying to tap into groups that we don't necessarily always have the best connections with or whether it's even setting ourselves up um, for future development. I do think that continues to be more than critical um, as we look to the next 100 years of building tractors here in the Cedar Valley and also just continuing to grow this area. I did have the opportunity um, to be here about 10 years ago when I was uh, coming through Deer the first time around through Waterloo with my career, and I just can't want to thank you guys for the progress and the development that's happened. I mean, it is impressive to bring people now through the downtown area, um, see what's happened down here, see what's happening at TechWorks. I mean, the journey of 15 years, seeing an old um, Deer factory right now converted into some of the, the highest end technology development that we can have. It really just continues to be impressive. So I just continue to encourage you guys to be supportive of that. Um, and how do we continue to work together to continue to invest and, and make this place even better? Um, I do think, you know, it's interesting, um, you know, one of the one of the things that I think will come out of COVID is this whole remote work dynamics. And that's going to push us, right? Like we've always been able to kind of bring talent into the area, but even as a company, we're starting to become more remote. And so it's going to become even more important as we go forward, I think, that we do create an environment um, that does attract people. And I think there's a lot of advantages here as far as a great place to raise your family and to be part of a community and to do some of that. Um, but it's going to be important that we continue to work together to invest in some of that. So thank you for all that you've done. It's been impressive to see what you've done over the last 10 years. Um, and I just look forward to being a part of it in the future. So thank you. 
Well, and we want to thank Deer for the, being an incredible partner to our city, and thank you. And I want to personally thank you for just jumping in with both feet and really getting in engaged in the community. So thank you. Thank you. Appreciate all the support. Questions from any of the council members from anybody from the Grow Cedar Valley? You've given us lots of great information. Thank you so much. And I know you've got to scurry over to our sister city. So unless there's something that you think we needed to cover that we didn't. Okay. All right. I know you're always available. So thank you all very, very much. And next on our agenda is Greg. All I'm going to talk about the International Property Maintenance Code. You're all right. You need some help, Greg? Is Chris setting something up for you? There we go. <laughs> Oh, you were hiding behind the podium. Okay. So Greg Allhelm, building official, City of Waterloo. I know fire has already been through this with you guys, so I won't go through everything about the adoption other than I will say that we are looking to move from the 2015 to the 2021. We do adopt new codes every six years approximately. So we're at that time again. Um, the state is looking to adopt in January of 2021, so we'd like to stay current with the state as well. Um, I have put in here a couple pages in, a couple slides in. I don't know if Chris has them up there, but the, 20, the 2018 codes actually had a change for emergency egress and rescue, which the 2021 is now taken out again. And that would be, Chris, I think it's back a couple slides. Okay. One more there, yeah. So you'll see emergency egress and rescue in 2018, they actually added that regardless of a building was sprinkler or not, like an apartment building or a, uh, a high rise of any sort for residential, that all windows below the fourth level of exit discharge had to be emergency egress windows. So they have removed that again in the 2021, and I think that's a, it's a good change. Um, above that, for business occupant loads, they used to be calculated at 100 square foot per person, and they've now upped that to 150 square foot per person, which gives designers a little more leeway as well. You can do a bigger office building without having to have two exits or emergency egress lighting, things of that nature, depending on if you can stay under 50 for an occupant load. So that's a nice break as well. New to the 2021 is a definition for puzzle rooms, which we've never had before. And we've had people come through and they want to do these escape rooms. We've never had a way to classify it other than just an assembly. By classifying them as special amusement, and uh, Mr. Bozen would know this, that anything over a thousand square foot has to be sprinkled. So that's another good addition, I believe. And then another one that is new is the automatic door openers which that comes into play for all groups A, B, M, R1, which R1s are uh, hotels, motels, and boarding houses. And the A's are churches, restaurants, casinos, nightclubs, gyms, bowling alleys, things of that nature. So if you were to build a new building and the occupant load is greater than 300, you have to have the automatic push button at the doors for the ADA. So another good addition, I think. And then the uh, last page kind of gets us up to date on all of the codes that I'm asking that we move into. So the building code, the residential code, mechanical, plumbing, electrical is already mandated by state, uh, the fuel gas code, and then uh, the two that are remaining would be the accessibility code and then the energy code. The state actually dictates when we adopt the energy code. So not too much for major changes by any means. I guess we're looking to possibly get that on for next council meeting if we can do that and hopefully get it, get those adopted when the state does. So it's kind of it in a nutshell. If you guys have any questions. Yeah, Mrs. Klein. Just to clarify, the automatic door openers are only on new construction? Correct. Okay, yes. Good. 
unless we change something in the ordinance, which is not a bad thing to have by any means. It's kind of surprising they've never have asked for that before, but it's good that they are now. I was thinking of the churches. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Any other questions? Great. You covered it so well, you left us. I wish there was more, questions. but yeah, there, I wish there was more. There's just not a lot that's new to the code for the IBC. So, okay. Well, All right. good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're way ahead of time for the complete streets. Bikes, yeah, complete streets. Um, Intercog is supposed to be joining by Zoom. Are they showing up yet or not? Pardon? Yeah, Kyle would be with Intercog. Can you guys hear me? This is Kyle from Intercog. Yeah, we can hear you, but Kyle, we're way ahead of schedule, which is kind of unusual. Um, we're not supposed to start till 425. We're so able, we're able to start early, but maybe we want to wait. We usually longer. can't start any earlier than yes. I thought. On a work session, we can. We can because it's approximated. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Have we got? Hi there. Is everybody here? Can we? I guess it's going to be up to the presenters. Do you want to go ahead and start early? I'm ready. Kyle, are you ready? Kyle's on board. I'm ready. Who else were you going to have with you, Kyle? Just me. Just the two of you? Mm-hmm. Okay. Are you ready to go, Kyle? Um, Howie, do you have the slides for us? If they're not uploaded all day. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, well, why don't I turn it over to you then, Felicia? Do okay. you want to introduce yourself? Yes, and I'd be happy to. I'm Felicia Cass, and I'm the chair of the Complete Streets Advisory Committee. And um, we appreciate the time to update you on where we are. So we came and talked to the council last August, September of uh, 2020 and asked um, if you would consider making a designated fund um, to support uh, the Complete Streets Initiative. And the feedback we got back is, well, tell us what the plan is. Like, tell us what you really need. So we have been busy putting together a pedestrian master plan for Waterloo. So uh, this says draft. Actually, the Complete Streets approved this plan last Tuesday. So what we're bringing to you is a finished plan. We're not asking council to um, adopt this at this point. The plan has a number of uh, policy, uh, policy provisions in it. And what we anticipate is that we'll be working with Noel and Jamie to uh, bring those policies to you and ask you to approve those. And this really casts a larger vision on where uh, Complete Streets sees um, the vision for Waterloo. So um, I just wanted, I don't know if we have some of the new council members in the house, but we wanted to give a little brief history on the Complete Streets Advisory Committee. So um, the council uh, approved in 2013, the Complete Streets Policy and CSAC was formed. 2014, we um, submitted our uh, policy and administrative uh, procedures for review and received uh, an award from the Smart Growth of America as one of the best Complete Streets Policies of 2013. Um, in 2018, we, we continue to update our rules. 2019, we created an infill policy for recommending sidewalk infill projects as part of the CIP. And we use a matrix to score those. Those are done in conjunction with the recon and the sidewalk projects. So while we have the crews there, what's the low hanging fruit in each of those areas? I mentioned that because we're gonna show you a map of um, areas that the community chose as their priority areas. And the first policy that we created uh, addresses those particular areas. 
This policy, so that was our 2018 policy, that's what we're using to score sidewalk projects that we um, make budget requests for. This policy goes outside of those areas to large areas where sidewalks don't exist. So you might think about um, Ridgeway Avenue is a very good example of that. Um, so this plan is being done as a response to the request from council um, to create this plan. And then I'm going to let Kyle talk to you about the policy, and I'll be back up to talk to you again about the sc how we're scoring. Thank you. Kyle, introduce, okay, your, you, introduce yourself, please. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Kyle Durant, and I'm a transportation planner within our town. <clears throat> I've been with the agency since 2009 and been a transportation planner since 2011. Um, so I'm going to go through the uh, uh, plan components pretty quickly here. Um, uh, uh, feel free to ask questions here towards the end if you'd like, or feel free to interrupt me. Uh, but the plan components themselves, uh, there's three parts. There's the priority sidewalk infill areas, policy recommendations, and then a scoring matrix. So to start off with, uh, I'll go over the priority sidewalk infill areas. And Felicia touched base on this uh, real quick that uh, we have been working on a pedestrian master plan as part of our MPO for uh, five or six years, which we're planning to adopt here pretty soon. But as part of that process, we had a very robust public input, uh, multiple different uh, ways of uh, doing public input from in-person meetings to an online survey. And out of all those uh, public input outreach efforts, we identified some focus areas or some infill areas throughout the Cedar Valley and, and Waterloo. Um, and so these are areas to, that we want to focus on for infill. Uh, they're neighborhood destinations, transit, recreation destinations. These are high impact areas where people are already walking and are, there are known uh, safety issues. On the next slide, I just have a zoomed in image of some of those infill areas. And Moving on to the next slide. Um, between that slide and the next slide, uh, it's just kind of a showing a showcase of if you, if the city were to in implement just a little bit of infill in some areas, how much of a change it can create to the overall sidewalk network in some of these infill areas. Moving on next to policy recommendations. So we've got a lot of uh, policy recommendations that are outlined in here. As I said, feel free to interrupt me or hold questions till at the end. So I'm going to kind of fire through these policy recommendations. These are some of the priorities to help improve walking conditions for residents and visitors. Uh, many of these were pulled from best practices at the federal, state, and local levels, and they align with uh, the draft MPO pedestrian master plan that I mentioned earlier. And we've broken these down into five different categories, general, planning and zoning, engineering, traffic control, and others. So under general recommendations, the first one, as Felicia mentioned, um, prioritize sidewalk construction and info needs identified in those priority info areas shown in yellow. As mentioned, these are high impact areas. These are people where people are already walking, uh, destination areas, and there are known safety issues in these info areas. Number two, establish a dedicated funding source for sidewalk maintenance. So the city already has a funding source for sidewalk maintenance. There are also other alternative funding sources for sidewalk maintenance. Um, these funds just help uh, uh, spread costs out over time. Number three, restructure and expand Met Transit service. So uh, we as staff have been working with Met Transit for a couple of years actually on uh, our route restructuring process to help reduce travel times, create easier navigation, just improve service overall. I won't speak too much more on this because you probably already heard about this. 
uh, and according to Met, they're set for uh, a launch of a restructured route system in summer 2022. Number four, revised snow removal policy and enforcement practice. Um, just simply put, uncleared sidewalks are dangerous. Uh, the picture you see is uh, all in San Martin. Um, we've seen pictures like this all across the city and uh, Waterloo's, you know, uh, not alone. There are other, this is common uh, in, in Iowa. Um, Snow removal policies usually don't take into consideration vacant properties or those residents that are physically unable to shovel or don't have the means to pay for shovel removal or snow removal service. So looking at re uh, revising some of those policy and enforcement practices. And moving on to planning and zoning recommendations. Number one, encourage sidewalk connections and site planning for new development. This just helps out to improve overall pedestrian connectivity in the community, create a more walkable city. The image on the right just shows uh, how a sidewalk connection from the main road to the uh, to a proposed building can help improve that actual uh, pedestrian connectivity uh, throughout the community. Number two, update zoning and subdivision ordinances to prioritize street connectivity. Um, there are multiple things that can be done to update zoning subdivision ordinances to support pedestrian friendly, friendly developments, such as driveway construction requirements, reducing minimum lot size, uh, requiring sidewalks and undeveloped lots. Um, there are many others. Uh, the image on the right just shows how prioritizing pedestrian connectivity uh, can help shorten the walking distance, for example. Uh, uh, it's a far shorter walking distance on the neighborhood network on the left to, from a house to a school. Number three, encourage transit-oriented development or TOD development, uh, to development. So this is about building up, not building out, which can help increase uh, mobility, higher foot traffic for commercial developments. Also can help reduce household spending on transportation. The idea is that you have a vertical infrastructure, uh, uh, Todd, uh, Todd developments that are connected to transit, that it's easy to get to, walk to, walk around, and then easy to get to other destinations as well. Number four, reduce minimum parking requirements. So reducing parking lot sizes can actually reduce the walking distance from street front to the commercial front. Uh, can also open up more developable land and also can reduce stormwater runoff. Number five, adopt pedestrian through zones on sidewalks and business districts. So uh, a through zone is a safe and adequate space for people to walk uh, uh, alongside uh, in front of businesses. We like to see uh, uh, seating and benches outside, especially in, in our downtown area, uh, but that does create a safety hazard for those walking through. So we need to make sure we have through zones uh, um, throughout, uh, throughout our business districts. This also uh, creates an opportunity for what's called a parklet, which uh, parklets are basically take, uh, taking existing parking spaces and creating uh, park areas or seating areas. The image on the, on the bottom shows an example of parklet. Um, so the idea is to prioritize pedestrians and not cars. Parklets uh, can also increase foot traffic to businesses. Next, we'll move on to the category of engineering recommendations. Number one, maintain the routine inspection program. So the city already has a, a, a sidewalk inspection program helps maintain the sidewalk infrastructure and really less expensive uh, to maintain the infrastructure in the long run than by doing a routine inspection. Number two, adopt street design standards to improve safety for all users. <clears throat> Adopting pedestrian friendly, stand friendly standards to support walking by default. Uh, image on the right is just a cover for the Urban Street Design Guide by the National Association of City Transportation Officials. 
there are many uh, great uh, documents to help uh, uh, adopt uh, street design standards focus on pedestrians. Number three, reduce design speeds along arterial and collector roads. So there is a direct correlation between higher speeds and crash risk and injury severity, as you can see on the chart on the right. Um, really reducing design speeds helps create safer places to walk and just reduces the overall crash risk. Number four, install curb extensions along arterial and collector roads. Curb extensions can also, are also known as uh, bump outs or bulb outs. Uh, they end up reducing crossing distance for pedestrians. They provide a traffic calming and just provide a safer and improved pedestrian environment. Um, think of Fourth uh, Street. Uh, we, we've got already some ex curb extensions that reduces the cross, uh, crossing distance for pedestrians. What the image that's shown on the right is a, is a more of a temporary type of bump out. So it can be permanent, it can be temporary. There's a lot of different ways to design these. Number five, support infrastructure for buses and bicycles. Uh, this type of infrastructure does serve as traffic calming, but also helps obviously provide the necessary infrastructure for bus, buses and bicycles uh, users. It uh, helps uh, reduce overall conflict points in the cor in corridors and provides overlapping benefits to pedestrians in general. Number six, improve the design of pedestrian crossings. Uh, just in general, improve safety and pedestrian comfort when you can help improve the design of pedestrian crossings. Uh, different methods include High visibility crosswalks, advanced yield and stop signs, curb extensions, and nighttime lighting. Number seven, provide adequate pedestrian accommodations during construction. So uh, <laughs> the image on the right shows a, uh, examples of what sidewalk detours should, should, should how, how they should be done, where somebody approaching a sidewalk that's co closed um, should be notified of the work ahead and uh, provided advanced warning to cross uh, early on to, get, uh, to the other side of the street or provide a sidewalk diversion on street. This is the law. This is part of the ADA law, uh, and it really comes down to pedestrian safety um, and, and just accommodating user, all users. Then uh, moving on to traffic control recommendations. Number one, adopt street design standards to improve safety for all users. Uh, this is a repeat uh, just under um, traffic control instead, so I won't go over that really in detail. Number two, phase out pedestrian actuated signals for fixed time signals. Um, so if you go to a pedestrian push button, uh, what will happen is you'll, you'll wait and then you'll get the, the, the walk signal. So basically it's prioritizing vehicle movement. In other words, a pedestrian has to uh, push a button to be able to uh, cross. They're often called bag buttons. Um, buttons uh, are not always easily accessible, especially those that may be mobility challenge. Uh, buttons may not work. I'll use a real life example. A while back I was trying to cross US 218 downtown and I couldn't cross because I pushed the push button and it didn't work. So I sat there and I sat there and I sat there and I sat there. And eventually I had to jaywalk because there was no other way to get across the street. So there are maintenance issues. Um, so what, what we're recommending is instead of a, actual, or a push signal, um, uh, moving towards fixed time signals where that's just part of the, the, the signal phase that the cross uh, sign would come up for pedestrians. Number three is a repeat as well, uh, support infrastructure for buses and bicycles. We'll move on to number four, apply highly visible markings at major crosswalks. So markings such as continental, zebra, and ladder uh, just provide improved safety for pedestrians. They're more visible for drivers. Uh, 
uh, there's data, data to support that, that uh, drivers can see those from a further distance, providing a better uh, 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 improved safety. Also, they can design, be designed to have uh, less maintenance over time. You can design it so that the vehicle's uh, tires actually pass all over non-painted areas so that, that you know, the, the painting actually will last longer on the, the pavement itself. And I'll close out by just firing through some other recommendations. Uh, one, ensure consistency of street signage in residential neighborhoods. Two, construct new or offset crosswalks and curb ramps in line with sidewalks. Three, avoid cutting down trees for new sidewalk construction. Four, emphasize pedestrian safety in public parking space layout. And last but not least, five, host an open streets event. So any questions? I'll pause there. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry, Mrs. Klein. Under planning and zoning, number four, reduce minimum parking requirements. Wouldn't that push cars out onto the street? So that would need to be context sensitive. So for instance, downtown where you've got a number of parking lots and you've got more than adequate parking for most events, um, we think there's some real opportunities there. Um, if you're talking um, apartment or condo construction, you, you might need a little different um, ratio of parking to facilities. So uh, the University of Iowa actually did a parking study downtown and showed that we have more than adequate parking for downtown. So um, we think there's some real opportunities there. Felicia, how broad was that UNI study? Did they go all the way out to Young Arena and Center for the Arts? Do you know? I don't. This was done in conjunction with... Um, Main Street, and um, Jessica was supposed to be sending that out, and I have not seen it yet. So okay. uh, we're going to do a little deeper dive into what they were looking, what they were recommending. I think we'd all be interested in seeing that when you get that. Okay, back. that'd be helpful. Great. Yes, Mrs. Klein. Another, my last question under traffic control recommendations. Um, number two, phase out pedestrian actuated signal signals for fixed time signals. Wouldn't, in the event of a broken button, wouldn't that be taken care of in the automatic cycle of the light? It, it doesn't. Kyle, do you want to speak to that? Don't, don't lights cycle? In the case... Yeah, that's the, that's the idea, too. Um, so a lot of times when you've got push buttons, when there's a cycle, it'll cycle through, and unless you push that button, you won't get the cycle as a pedestrian. So... If you don't push that button, it'll cycle through, but you won't receive a cross, uh, a pedestrian crossing symbol. So the idea is to incorporate that cross or walk symbol into the actual cycle. So if I went up to a, a, a signal and I wanted to cross, I know that I'd get that pedestrian symbol. Oh, so you're not asking for a separate stop of traffic. You're simply asking for the pedestrian walk sign to be activated as the natural site, I get you. Yes. Okay, thank you. Correct, mm -hmm. Madam Chair. Other questions? Yes, David. Yeah, I, had a, I had a question that I'd like. I'm, I particularly would like to see the downtown parking study. Okay, we'll get uh, that for you. Be, because a, as we add more and more residential units and, and multi-story residential units, we're not adequate, adequately allowing enough parking because the C three designation doesn't require a number of parking spaces. Other communities require X amount of parking spaces per bed. Uh, so I would be more than, uh, I'd really like to see that study because I, we're, we, we continue to add more residential downtown and, and uh, I don't think we have adequate parking for the residential. I mean, if you look at the, the, the project at six and commercial, they're gonna, they're gonna if, if this ever uh, gets off the ground, we're gonna add 70 residential units with 20 parking spaces. And the same, and we see, have the same issue with art block and 300 commercial yeah. that we, that 
with Art Block, we, I, I can tell you we don't have enough parking there. And you know we're working to try to create more parking, but we don't have enough. So uh, uh, I, I'm just curious in how that, how that university looked at it and how it was scored. We'll get that to you. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else? <laughs> okay, okay, Mrs. Klein. Okay. Well, I would just like to piggyback on what my colleague, Mr. Boson, said as a liaison to the library. The library's parking is, is very highly pressured by the closeness of, it's going to be much worse when the art block opens up. And right now it's got single speed and all those other areas that are filling up. And as a result, their parking lot has much difficulty keeping it for their patrons. Right. So I think one of the issues that we're going to have to address is what what is adequate? How far are you willing to walk? So if you think about going to a major city, what's your expectation about how far you will need and what's an adequate walk distance versus what's your expectation here? Um, the, the point we're trying to make is that the higher, the higher the density of development, the more thriving your, your businesses and your community is going to be. And but it's going to mean people are going to have to walk mm -hmm. maybe more than a quarter of a mile, which is what I suspect is our more comfortable walking range currently or what we expect. And so we're going to have to talk about that. What does that look like and where, how far are we willing to go? We, I know we have parking ramps that are underused. And think of all the parking underneath the, the highway. There is a, a lot of parking there. Yeah. People don't want to walk. And yeah. so we have, we also have citizens that need help if we're doing an event. So if you think about the hockey events, you know, I know they're working to get shuttles running to help. So there are things that we can do to alleviate high need that accommodate all users, because that's certainly the goal of Complete Streets, all users at all times. Yeah. Madam Chair, good point. Quick, yeah, quick follow-up, because you mentioned that the parking ramps are underutilized. Now, on that park, on that study, on that on those spaces, did that take into effect the amount of spaces that we guaranteed Best Western? Um, because I haven't seen the parking study, I can't comment on that. But we will be happy to bring that back and discuss that with you. Okay, because they they do get in their development agreement a, a large portion of that parking ramp. No, is it a hundred or two hundred spaces? I think it's two hundred. And are those dedicated, are they just empty all the time, or is that based on <coughs> supply and demand? Based on supply. Yeah. But, but they're, so they're, they're not still... dedicated. If, if there's some other use for those spaces, they're available. Although we do, we did guarantee them, they might not be dedicated, but we did, did guarantee them that they would have those spaces for their patrons. But look at the other ramps that are certainly underutilized as well. So. Okay, thank you. Any so other in, questions? Yes, go we're ahead. We're not done. We're, that's oh, just the first okay. half. <laughs> okay, go so, ahead. Um, so like the infill projects that we, where we score um, sidewalk projects, we have created a scoring mechanism for these um, larger sidewalk areas. So I wanted to talk about those matrix uh, categories. We have a safety and health category that has 45 points, an equity category with 30 points, Pedestrian attractions, which just means, is it clo how close is it to pedestrian attractions? 25 points. Constructability, is it easy to construct, hard to construct? Um, and the costs go into that constructability score. So right now, the ideal project would get 140 points, and we're going um, based off of that. I do want to run you through the scoring matrix, and I want to acknowledge the work that Wayne Castle has done. Uh, it's just tremendous how he's used census data um, and created layered maps that let us go through and score it. We're not going to show you all of that today, but I would invite you to come sit in on a meeting when we're scoring. It's really, I think it's really impressive. So under safety and health, we are looking at, is it a major arterial or a local street? So how much traffic is on that street? So just like we know, if there's a lot of if it's an arterial, it's going someplace that people want to go. We'd like, we're going to be giving that a higher score because we want to make sure that walkers can get to destinations. 
Uh, we look at the average annual daily traffic count that gets to safety, the speed limit, the reported um, pedestrian vehicle or bike injuries or collisions in that area, and is there an alternate path of travel? We have a lot of areas we'd like to cover. If there's sidewalk on at least one side of the street, then we're giving it a lower score. We need to move on and fill in the other areas. The next piece is equity. And I do want to say that um, our plan is to use these matrix, score things, and see how, it, how does this really work in real life. And we expect that we will come back and revise some of these pieces. So under equity, um, are the what are the percent of residents in the area um, served if with under 18-year-old children? And that's compared to the city as a whole. The percent of residents who, who are over 65, is that greater than the city as a whole? Percent of households in areas served with median income less than the county as a whole. Percent of population in the area served um, with non-white residents, uh, if that's higher than the whole, that gets a higher score. Uh, percent of population in areas served that has a higher population of disabled persons than the city as a whole. And the percent of the population in areas served that are non-English proficient um, if that's higher than the county as a whole, that gets a higher score. On pedestrian attractions and proximity, um, Wayne created school walk sheds that show us how, if are we within a mile radius of a school, that gets a higher score. Is there a park within a half mile radius of the area we're studying, that gets a higher score. Is it near a voting or polling center? Is it near a grocery store? Or is it on a fixed transit route? All of those things get a higher score. Then constructability. Um, is it easy to construct? So things like grade, sidewalk, um, other utilities, those kind of things can drive constructability costs up. And then uh, what's the total construction cost? So some of the, the pieces that we scored are very long and so very expensive. And what we might want to do is come back and break those up. So we went through and scored West Donald Street from Cedar Bend Street to Burton Avenue, Hammond Avenue from East Ridgeway to East San Marnin Drive, East Ridgeway Avenue from Baltimore to Hammond Avenue, West 4th Street from Ansboro to Sheridan Road, Crossroads Boulevard, the outer ring only, West Ridgeway Avenue from West 4th to Kemble Avenue, Cedar Bend Street from Walker Street to Oakwood Drive, Longfellow Avenue from Virginia Street to Lucas Street, and Flamang Drive from East San Marnin Drive to Crossroads Boulevard. I want to pull out, for instance, Ridgeway Avenue. Um, its point total puts it in towards the bottom of the pack, but a big driver of that is the length of that project and the cost really lowers the score. So we, we tried to identify the major areas that we thought, um, I believe we hit at least one project per, so that it was spread across the council. Um, and then I think visually, do we have a map that kind of shows yeah, where those areas are? So that you can see that when the city was first developing, we, we just, as a matter of course, put sidewalks in. And then when we hit the 50s, right, the automobiles, post-World War II, the automobile comes into play. And those are areas where the sidewalks aren't. Um, and we need sidewalks there. It's our contention that we need sidewalks there. Also, if you notice, um, some of the areas we chose, like uh, Flamang Drive, is very low. Uh, scoring, but it scored low because there aren't a lot of people there, there's not a lot of current demand, but should the vision that the mayor's cast of that becoming a, a recreation center, then that would completely change the scoring here. So this is flexible, the scoring is very flexible depending on development and what's going on in the community. 
Um, so that wraps up our presentation. Madam Chair. Well, first, kudos to everybody for all the work you put into this. This is pretty impressive. Good Thank job. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Greiner. Um, Madam, so, Madam. so on the on the scoring rubric, um, just because as a school employee, I know things are a little bit different. I would recommend breaking that down because for elementary school students, if they're less than a mile, then they have to walk under the current bus system. But for middle school, it's um, if they're less than two miles and then for high school, it's less than three miles, uh, which can be quite a distance. Um, thinking about the area that covers near West and East High uh, or our middle school. So that might just be something to look at uh, for the matrices, because I do know that there are lots of students who, who do walk as well. Just something to think about in the future. Great, Mr. You. Morrissey, did you did you want to respond to that, Felicia? No, I, I this is the kind of input we're looking for. Good. Mr. Morrissey, did you have a question? Yeah, Madam Chair, I just wanted to uh, um, say that I, I've been on the Complete Streets Advisory Committee uh, and got to listen to this and got to watch this as it uh, progressed and as it grew into this this working, um, uh, the working idea became an actual on paper idea. And I, I, I can't say enough and commend the people that were on this committee uh, more, it's uh, uh, it's quite remarkable how detailed and intricate it is. But at the meeting that we had the other day, uh, it was noted that when we, when it's being brought to council, uh, it, it's important that the council uh, realize and understand what's going into this, uh, why it's being put uh, in the language and in the way that and the method that has uh, been presented to the council today with the understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, Felicia, uh, that if the council or anybody out there, when they see this, has some other kinds of ideas about things that they like to see added, changed, tweaked, whatever, that uh, the uh, committee is more than open to those kind of suggestions. So thank you very much. Felicia and all of the Complete Streets people that were involved in this. Great job. Thanks, Pat. And Felicia, what do you, well, one of the things is to hold a public event. Are you planning on doing that soon or what are your thoughts? We there? don't have any plans to do that soon. So we um, asked Jamie and Noel for comments on this and we uh, went through and selected some low hanging fruit. We'll go back back because we've had a few revisions as we've been drafting this policy and decide what really are the low hanging fruit that we want to um, pursue over the next year. So this policy took us a year and a half <laughs> to devise, but it's pretty comprehensive. Um, and I, my hope is that we can knock off several policies, just continue to chip away at this. We would like to come back to the council in April once you're through the budget process and um, talk with you more about how do we get a dedicated line of funding so that we can prioritize uh, the policies we do work on. April might be a little late. I'll put you two years out. Yeah, don't you think? If, you want to, if you're waiting until the following budget year. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, it feels like the budget process is sort of baked in for this year, and so what really what we're trying to do is get ahead of for 2023, okay. yeah. Gotcha. If, if I sense right from the council, we'd like to have some assurance that you've looked at that school distance as part of the criteria, and that we'd also like to see that parking study. Other than that, what are you wanting from us next? I think next is a deeper conversation about where do we find the funding. So okay. what I would ask of you is, as you go through your budget process, take out what is going to cost to put sidewalks just on on um, you know one side of Ridgeway? I believe the Ridgeway cost actually is sidewalk on both sides of the street. Okay, but keep you know keep these are big projects. But we don't have the cost for all of your proposals. Yes, right? you do. Are they included in for every project? 
We've uh, got the, that. the 10 or what, eight that we scored. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So they're all there. They're all okay. there. So, um, you know, Let's as see. you're looking at the budget this year, look at that as well. Look at that as well. And, um, I, you know, if you can come up with a way to fund it, we'll come up with a way to spend it. <laughs> <laughs> That's usually not a problem, right? <laughs> That's sure. right. I do want to. Do I, I, I had another quick question on, on your budget because it says under three hundred thousand, under six hundred thousand, under eight hundred thousand, but that's not giving us an exact amount. Yeah. Right. But but you're but you're you're saying that is you're that's estimating it's going to be three hundred thousand. Those so are that's the numbers you're giving us. Yes. Okay. It's around there, you know. If you if you really want to do that project, it would require some engineering and some. Okay. Could be more or less. So that's the, okay. the, what you're talking about as far as the cost estimates is what, okay. Right. So if you look more. at the scoring matrix, it gives you, um, we used a $60 a linear foot as a cost estimate. So okay. it, it's actually in there. Um, now, um, the reality is what happened, engineering took a look at it and said, it's hard, it's okay, it's easy. So it there's, it's a little squishy. Okay. I wouldn't want to tell you that's going to be the final cost, but it gets us in the neighborhood. Okay. Other questions from council? Again, thanks to everyone. Appreciate all your work. Good job, Kyle. I do want to recognize, because this was a pretty big effort, that we had Kyle, we had Aldina, um, I'm not going to say Aldina's name right. Kyle, are you still on? Okay. <laughs> uh, Eric Schroeder. Wayne, thank you. Uh, Eric Schroeder, Wayne Castle, Anne-Marie Kafka, who is our new vice chair and is here tonight, Kyle Durant, Aldina, Brian Schoon, and Cody Leesman all contributed and worked on this project. So um, it, t it took, it was a real team effort. It took a village. Yeah. It did. Good job. Thank and you And thank much. you for continuing to move this forward. I know your passion you're, is you're welcome. one of the major drivers here. So thank you. Thank you for your time. I appreciate thank you. it. Any other questions? No. Okay. Then I'm going to go ahead and turn it over. Uh, for a discussion of a resolution voicing support for local media and concern about newsroom consolidations. Mr. Greiner. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so in mid-November, it was reported that Alden Global Capital uh, was looking at buying uh, Davenport-based Lee Enterprises, which is the uh, parent company for a number of newspapers most significant to us, the Waterloo Cedar Falls Courier. Um, I looked at this news with a, with a bit of shock um, and dismay um, because of, of business practices that Alden Global Media has um, that have been reported by, by other news agencies, including NPR and Bloomberg and some other agencies. Um, this uh, acquisition um, that's potentially on the table um, would add a plethora of, of local newspapers to Alden Global Capital's portfolio. Um, but my concern is fundamentally that that would not be good um, for our citizens. Um, and, and the big reason is because Alden Global Capital is a hedge fund. It is designed to make money. And I begrudge no one in their desire uh, to make money. Um, however, news agencies also have another purpose, and I would argue a higher purpose, um, which is to inform citizens of the goings-on of their local community. Um, and, and just recently, we have seen uh, local articles in the Courier about a menorah lighting, about a new event center opening up in a former restaurant, uh, a new restaurant opening up downtown. And those aren't, those aren't big. They're not earth-shattering. Sorry, Amy. Uh, but... <laughs> They're important to our community. It's important to those businesses. It's important to residents of our community. And, and one of my concerns um, is that this large um, hedge fund has, has a tendency to um, shrink down newsrooms in an attempt to increase profit margins, which are very small in newspapers, and I get that. However, I think that something fundamentally would be missing if 
we stopped getting those types of stories about our community. Um, and this is not just a, a personal belief. Uh, there are um, political science studies that show uh, that cities that lose their local newspapers see economic decline of anywhere between 25 and 50 percent. Uh, they see uh, local government budgets increase between anywhere between 15 and 35 percent uh, because there's not someone flashing the light of transparency, uh, because there's not someone sitting in the chamber telling other people what we're saying. Um, it shows that corruption and crimes go underreported for areas uh, because there aren't local people on the beat. Um, now, the courier is not perfect, and I and I said that to Amy, uh, and I'll but. What is important about the courier is that they are local and that they have local people here. Mm -hmm. And I know that there are people who are concerned uh, about us sort of dipping into the waters of, of telling businesses what to do. And in most cases, I would say that that's, that's not um, our purview, uh, unless we're talking about a development agreement or something else specifically with the city. But my concern is that newspapers represent sort of a different area for me uh, of private enterprise because they are designed to inform citizens. And I think it is important that we and whoever follows us are held accountable to the public. And a really, really key and fundamental part of that is local media. Uh, and we've seen in communities where local media disappears or shrinks um, that that space, because nature abhors a vacuum, is often take, taken up by social media, which if people aren't aware, uh, social media is not always truthful um, when reporting the news. I know that is shocking to lots of folks. So I think this is very important. So, uh, so I wrote this resolution um, mostly just saying, hey, we are concerned about this. Uh, the First Amendment guarantees the right to a free press. We think that that's really important. We think that our local reporters and their staff um, whether it's uh, print media or digital media or um, TV stations, that they're doing an important job that's really important uh, for our community, for holding us accountable, for making sure that our local economy is, is being reported on and covered, um, and that we want local media to cover local affairs. So that is what this resolution pertains to, and I'm more than happy to, to answer any questions uh, that anyone might have about it or language or anything of that nature. Questions from the council? Mr. Greiner, when are you suggesting that this would be on the agenda? If I have four votes, uh, I would we would put it on the 20th. On the 20th. So our next, our next regular session. And I would just make the comment yeah. that to me, it's kind of a slippery slope for the council to make um, recommendations to the private sector, but that hasn't stopped us from doing so in the past. Um, and I certainly understand all of your comments. So, Mrs. Klein. I've, I've had some serious thoughts about that, this since I read it in the paper. Um, it is critical, I think, that the city council does not attack companies that look to buy businesses here. I think that is a terrible precedent to set, to look into a, a business that you may not personally approve of, but that is a perfectly legal business. I think it's absolutely wrong, and it, sells, it sends a chilling message to companies looking to come here, that if they aren't the you know, politically correct company of the day, they might not have a nice welcome here. I think that's way off base. Also, government intervention in a free press is a huge mistake, whether you go after the business practices or whether you go after the business content. Both attacks are wrong. We have no business shading any business deal that's legal here in Waterloo. We're supposed to be open and friendly and the transactions between the courier and the company looking to buy them are private. They're private. We have nothing to do it. And it, this also chills business. And I think it goes against our code of ethics. And I think that this behavior deserves censure. 
Let me, if someone else wants to respond I think to Mr. that, Morrissey give it to was, Mr. Grant. Trying to come in. Mr. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Mr. Morrissey. Well, I, 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 I don't believe what I just heard. I, I mean, I'm sure you don't. We are a, uh, excuse me? Not at this time. May I continue? Yes, go ahead. You have the floor, Mr. Morrissey. Okay, well, um, I, I understand uh, what uh, uh, Councilman Greider is saying here, and uh, I, uh, I guess I have a problem with anybody thinking that we as elected officials don't have a right to free expression uh, when it comes down to what we would feel is a possible um, loss of a voice within the community. Now, we all, I think, have lived long enough to realize that our uh, Waterloo Cedar Falls Courier has seen a remarkable um, uh, downsizing over time uh, to the point where it is right now. And that is just fact. Um, and what is happening here is just fact. And um, the resolution that Councilman Greider is submitting here just says what is known to be factually based and our concern. And if uh, there is any uh, part of public concern about any action and the potential uh, fallout from uh, what might occur, we as elected officials within the city of Waterloo have not just a right, but a duty to bring that forward. So I applaud Councilman Greider for bringing this forward, for recognizing this and putting forth a resolution that says, we believe in free speech and we don't want to risk that being lost by our only voice within our community, printed voice in our community. Uh, and that's what I see. So I support this resolution and I would be in favor of moving it forward. Uh, Madam chair. Madam chair. Madam chair. Madam chair. Okay. Uh, Mr. Foyce. No, you haven't. Mr. Okay. Mr. Boyson. Or close Both. enough. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, uh, I I think it's a slippery slope, and I, I'll have to do a lot of a lot of uh, uh, soul searching on this uh, when this when this comes before us. I think Lee Enterprises is doing a really good job right now of heading this off, uh, based on what I've been reading. That uh, and I, and I hope it, it continues. I we all voiced our support for the UAW members when they went on strike, but we didn't do a resolution that that not condemned, but pointed out our, our feelings about deers. And so I, I just, I'll have to, I'll have to uh, work on it in the next two weeks. Mr. Foyce. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if I'm 100% committed yet on, on this, but I'm also very concerned because it's something that I had heard some things over the summertime. Um, and I guess didn't pay much attention to until, you know, it's one of those where if we don't, it's not here in our backyard, we don't necessarily pay attention to it. Um, I, I did note, and I have to go back and I, as I'm sitting here thinking about it, you know, realize like the, the Cedar Rapids Gazette moved their printing operation hundreds of miles away, taking jobs and, and things from that community. And as, and I asked Mr. Greider, for more like where he got some information and he sent eight or 10 different articles from various um, news organizations. I think that kind of run the gamut of it. And, and I want to spend some more time looking at this, but it, it's scary to, to read some of the things. That's what I told him. I said, it was scary stuff when you, you have a company that the, the purpose isn't to grow the purpose is financial gain, and I get it that that companies want that financial gain, but the effect that it have that it has on the communities, I think, is is what we have to pay attention to, and what was going on 
and listening to the the members of the press that have been a part of this um and I think the one of the articles we just that was just in the Courier and, and nationally was, you know, like a hostile takeover. This isn't something where they're coming in and doing something to benefit communities. It's it's certainly a hostile takeover. That's what many of these places talked about. And so I think we have to be observant of a lot of these things. And and you know, one of the articles from the Atlantic struck me out struck out stuck stuck out to me. And it says, this investment strategy does not come without social consequences. When a local newspaper vanishes, research shows it tends to correspond with lower voter voter turnout, increased polarization, and a general erosion of civic engagement. As Mr. Greider had had mentioned before, misinformation proliferates city city budgets balloon, along with corruption and dysfunction, and the consequences can influence national politics as well. And I think as as divisive as we've seen our politics in the last few years, that's scary that we we don't have people like Amy and and Andrew Wynn to go and, you know, they get stretched thin. I think that was the common thread is we have reporters and, and editors who want to do the job but they can't do it one because they're fired if they do their job but if they then they're involved and they're so few that they have to figure out what needs to happen and i think we want citizens to be in as engaged as possible with our city politics and things like this actually have the opposite effect and that's concerning but not sure i'm on a hundred percent on board with the resolution yet i do want to do some more more research <clears throat> Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. Amos. Uh, yeah, like uh, my fellow councilman here, Mr. Bolson, I've read it. I've been paying attention to it. And, you know, I I know that um, from what I've read, Lee Enterprises has does not want these individuals more on their board. And I look at this resolution, and it, it's resolved, and it says that we express our concern and dismay. And the information that I'm hearing, you know, there is a problem. And it is a business that is coming in here not for the benefit of our community. And as far as a slippery slope, it probably is. But for me, if a business is coming in here, we're going to see jobs going away. We're going to see things going in a negative direction. Then we need to be on that slippery slope. That's the way that I feel about it. So for me, Councilman Greider, I will be supporting this. And let me just add that while I agree with some of what Mrs. Klein said, getting into private sector is sometimes um, challenging and does present that, that slippery slope. I do think we have a responsibility to let the community know our belief on the impact, what such an acquisition would have on the community. And second, we have a responsibility to look at the track record of the company looking to acquire a local asset and what the impact would be based on that history. So with that, um, I think we all have a responsibility to do our homework, and it is certainly an interesting challenge to all of us. Mr. Graner, any final comments? Uh, Mrs. Klein. Yes. I'm sorry, Mr. Morrissey? No, I raise my hand. Yeah, I do. I know. Uh, I just, Mrs. Klein can go. I'll wrap up. Go, go ahead. Mrs. Klein's got the floor my first. My last comments are this. This is a private business. It is market-based. Market-based private businesses succeed when they are supported by the general public. To me, the saddest thing about our lovely Waterloo Courier is that it has decided and made a business decision to move to Cedar Falls. And the, and the courier, I believe, can be quoted by saying, we found a better opportunity in Cedar Falls. That is what we should address. The opportunities that we need in Waterloo to provide companies to stay here. We should not be involved in the private business of this company. Thank you. Mr. Morrissey. Well, I just wanted to say that uh, I would ask that uh, this be on the agenda 
uh, if possible, for our next meeting, December 20th. Okay, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, so I'll just, I'll just finish with this. Um, I'm not going to engage in uh, name calling here, um, but I, I do want, I, the, sorry, not name calling, the political games. Um, and so, but what I do want to address is, is this sort of fundamental belief that, that I've heard. And I, and I get the slippery slope argument, um, but we just had a work session where we talked about the adopting the international building code for businesses and public spaces that go up in our city. Is that us not interfering with the free market economy of what builders want? Um, Mr. Anderson is going to bring up, um, hopefully soon in a work session, and then we're going to hopefully vote on it, um, the details of a plan that we all voted for um, to offer incentives for childcare facilities to grow or expand. <laughs> so, so to say that we don't get involved in private business um, is, is inherently false, first and foremost. Secondly, I would incredibly argue that it is our duty as elected officials to pay attention to what businesses do. Just because a business wants to come to town does not mean if they have practices that are potentially harmful or dangerous to our community that we just throw open the doors. And there are studies that have shown that this could potentially be dangerous, lead to increased polarization, which we have already seen in this chamber through the last election cycle, and potentially leave our citizens less engaged and less informed. Now, if someone wants to argue that they don't see that as a danger, that is perfectly legitimate. I have no problem with that. But to state that our job is to welcome with open arms anyone, regardless of the potential perceived danger, to me is in and of itself dangerous. That's all I have. Thank you. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you.